let's introduce the core concept of MCP or the Model Context Protocol. Now, MCP is an open protocol that standardizes how applications provide context to LLMs. And we did a previous video on the channel and that had a practical example where we had a Postgres database that provided context via the MCP protocol to a large language model. So this one is going to be a more high level video on the core concepts in the MCP protocol. So let's dive in and if you want to support the channel you can check out our coffee page which is linked below the video and we've also opened up channel memberships. So thank you to everyone that signed up for that. We're going to be running some polls soon on future content for members. So if you want to join the channel, check out that link below the video. Let's get started and go back to MCP. Now what MCP does is essentially it allows you to build AI agents and complex workflows on top of large language models. And the reason that you might need this is because language models frequently need to integrate with data and tools. And examples of that might be you're part of a company or a business and you have proprietary tools and databases and so on that contains data you want to leverage and provide to a language model as relevant context. Now language models, if you know anything about ChatGPT and so on, these have been trained on large amounts of open data, but they do not know specific information about, for example, your business or data you might have locally. So the goal of MCP is to provide a standardized way to provide this context from other areas to the language models. Now MCP provides a growing list of pre-built integrations that your language model can directly plug into and it also provides flexibility to switch between LLM providers and vendors and best practices for securing your data within your infrastructure. So let's have a very quick look at this general architecture. The MCP protocol has a host that contains the MCP client and examples of that include Claude, and the MCP client will then connect to one or more MCP servers. And those servers can retrieve context from a variety of sources, for example, databases, APIs, files on the file system, and so on. And they can return the most relevant context to the MCP client, which can then be added to the prompts and then sent to the language model to help answer the question or provide information depending on the use case or the context of your application. So we have these three core components. We have MCP hosts, and that's programs like Claude Desktop, IDEs like Cursor, and so on. And these hosts contain the clients. So MCP clients, they maintain one-to-one -one connections with the MCP server. And of course, the server itself is a lightweight program, and it exposes specific capabilities through the standardized model context protocol. Now, if we look at the concepts section on the left-hand side, there's a section on the core architecture of the MCP protocol. We're going to have a look at these concepts here of resources, prompts, and tools. So let's start with resources. These are kind of similar to HTTP GET requests. They allow you to expose data and content from your MCP servers to LLMs. So resources are a core primitive in the model context protocol, and the data and content that you expose with a resource can then be read by the MCP client and used as context for LLM interactions. So the idea behind resources is simply about retrieving data and providing it as context. Resources should not be performing any significant computation or having side effects. They should simply return some data that can be useful to the LLM in the specific context. Now, some examples of where this data might come from include things like files on the file system, or it could be objects in cloud storage. Think of things like Azure Blob Storage and S3 buckets on Amazon. So your resources can expose data from these objects. It can also be that your resources are fetching data from a database, and that could be a proprietary database that you have internally. You're fetching that data, and that can help provide answers, for example, to clients that are connected through a chatbot. And of course, you can also connect to web APIs, get data, and expose that data. That would be another example of a resource. So basically, a resource represents any kind of data that an MCP server wants to make available to clients. And we have some of these examples here, including things like log files, screenshots, and images, and so on. And the MCP protocol gives you a way to actually discover these resources. So the MCP server will expose a list of resources through this request here, resources slash list. Now, if we go to the section on reading resources, in order to actually read the contents of a specific resource, clients are going to send a resources slash read request with the resource URI. And you can see the response. It will contain the URI and a MIME type, but it will also contain one of the following. It's going to be the text if you have a text-based resource or the blob if it's a binary resource. Now, another important concept is this one here of tools in the MCP protocol. These enable LLMs to perform actions through the MCP server. And basically these enable servers to expose executable functionality to clients. So the LLMs can then interact with external systems and perform computations and take actions in the real world. 
Now one difference between tools and resources is that tools are designed to be controlled by the model, so the AI model should be able to automatically invoke tools when they decide it's the appropriate tool to actually invoke based on the context. And this is different from resources, the AI model does not automatically call resources, but instead the client applications such as Claude Desktop must manage the access to the resource. Now as it said above, tools in MCP, they allow servers to expose executable functions, and this allows you to perform side effects and actions with the language model. And if we go to this section here, as it says here, unlike resources, tools represent dynamic operations, and they can modify state and interact with external systems, and this makes them more similar to, for example, an HTTP POST request, rather than resources, which is more similar to a GET request. So if you're familiar with web development and the HTTP protocol, these are the kind of analogues here in this MCP protocol. So what could a tool do? What kind of executable actions could we have? Now one example might be to send an email. We might want some automation here to actually generate and send an email. So that's going to have a side effect and a real world action. It's actually going to send an email to somebody and that could be handled by a tool. Now other examples include things like browser automation if you're using a system like Puppeteer or updating any kind of database or making any changes to any kind of state whether it's on the file system, in a database or across an API. If you have a tool controlling that then the LLM can then make informed decisions and use that tool. And let's imagine one example. You have an AI agent and it's responsible for booking a hotel room and that could be somewhere like New York for example for two nights. And you could build a system that has some MCP tools that can be used to perform actions such as checking availability of rooms, checking prices and reviews, and then making the actual booking. So the idea behind these tools is that they actually make real world decisions based on input, and they can actually affect the state of the world that they're in, for example, changing systems and communicating with other people via this protocol. Now, as well as resources and tools, another core concept is this one here of prompts. And you're probably familiar with the concept of a prompt in general. So a reusable prompt template and workflow, these can be created in the MCP protocol and clients can easily surface these prompts to users and to language models. Now this provides a powerful way to standardize and share common LLM interactions. And notice that it says here that prompts are user controlled. So this means they are exposed from the server to clients with the intention of the user actually being able to explicitly select the prompt for use. And these prompts in the MCP protocol, they are predefined templates, they can accept dynamic arguments, they can include context from the resources that we discussed earlier, and they can also chain multiple actions and guide specific workflows. Now you can imagine a prompt that is going to ask the model to review the code in a specific programming language, for example Python. You can define that prompt in such a way that it's going to get the best response from the model and that's the power of the prompt in general. And some other examples might include a prompt where the user provides two dates and you ask the model to provide a summary of data between those two dates. So you can embed the actual dates provided by the user into the prompt and then you can generate that summary. And again, email and SMS generation in a specific tone, you could easily build that into a prompt as well. And the main idea behind this is just to get better responses from the language model. So resources, prompts and tools are core concepts in the MCP protocol. I want to finish the video by looking quickly at transports. Now transports in MCP provide the foundation for communication between the MCP client and the MCP servers. So the transport handles the underlying mechanics of how messages are sent and received. And messages go across the wire using the JSON RPC 2.0 format. And the transport layer is responsible for converting MCP protocol messages into JSON RPC when it's transmitting messages and also for converting the received JSON RPC back to MCP protocol messages on the other end. Now I want to look at the two built-in transport types and you can provide your own custom transports on top of this but the two built-in ones are the standard input and output transport and this enables communication through standard input and standard output streams and that's most useful for local integrations and command line tools and as well as that we now have streamable HTTP and this transport uses post requests for client to server communication and you can also have server sent event streams for server to client communication if that's necessary. So any kind of web-based integration where everything's not on the same machine, chances are you're going to use the streamable HTTP transport for those. And any kind of client-server communication over the HTTP protocol is going to use this. And also anything that requires stateful sessions and multiple concurrent clients, these are going to use the streamable HTTP transport. And with this transport, every JSON RPC message from the client to the server 
is sent as that post request. The server will then respond either with a JSON response, in which case we have content type of application JSON, or it will send back a server sent events stream, and that has the content type of text slash event stream. We won't go into the specifics of this, but if you do need server to client communication, then MCP servers can send the requests and notifications to clients using server sent event streams. So that's an overview of some of the core concepts of the model context protocol. And we've looked at resources, prompts and tools. And we also had a brief look at transports. And if you want to see the practical example where we built an MCP server with Python and exposed a tool that connected to a Postgres database and fetched relevant information, as well as a resource that exposed data from a file system, then you can check out that link just below the video to watch that. And if you want to support the channel and you find this content useful, check out the coffee page that we have just below the video. And don't forget to like and subscribe as well if you've not already done so. And thanks again for watching. We'll see you in the next video.